This morning I'm going to teach you something that the Holy Ghost just said will change your life if you apply it. Some of you already are doing this, but you need to know why we're doing things. We need to constantly be reminded. We were talking about the missing link. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 22. Now we're going to talk about why. Why it's important to participate in this thing called other tongues. We're going to get revelation on this in the last days. People need to know how God works, why God works, why God gives us certain things to do. What is the benefit of it? And what is the uh, mystery behind it all, so to speak? In Matthew chapter 22, and I'm going to attach this uh, this morning. Everybody say this with me out loud. Linking tongues to development in love. And the reason I'm putting love here is because everything in the New Testament revolves around love. If you're ever going to have any character, you better have love. Everything we do has to operate from love or it's going to, it's going to misfire. Even the gifts of the Spirit will misfire if they're not operated in love. The Bible says that. So it's important. And I'm not talking about uh, unscriptural love. I'm talking about real scriptural agape love. Jesus made it clear in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36, where he said, uh, somebody said to him, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love, thy, uh, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Everybody say commandment. Amen. Not a suggestion. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Three things contained within them. You need to love God. You need to love your neighbor, and you need to love yourself. If you can't love yourself properly, you'll never be able to project love to your neighbor. This is a major issue with people because there's a self-loathing and self-hating that goes on in our society that is really, really at an all-time high. Now, I want you to notice that he said this is a, a commandment, not a suggestion. This is the cardinal rule of the New Testament. And Jesus uses the word love here. He uses the word agape. He made it clear. He made a new word. In fact, the New Testament made a new word for this because they didn't have a word for this. They had a word for friendship, love, filio. They had a word for eros, erotic love, and other things. But they didn't have a word that described God's love, so they made up a new word called agape. And Jesus said this agape, his disciples were going to have. Other people who are not Christians do not have this. This is what separates us from other people. Unfortunately, we haven't done a very good love uh, job of developing this love. And because of that, people in the world look at the church and kind of think we're a big joke. And we are a big joke because we have not really done what Jesus said because we haven't done all of his commandments and we haven't understood how these things work. We've got a lot of people that are unhooked up with the Holy Ghost that have been told over the years you've got to walk in love. And believe me when I say this, it's impossible to walk in love without being hooked up with the Holy Ghost. Because you can't do anything unless you're inviting, abiding in Jesus or the Holy Ghost. You're cut off from the life source. And folks, let me tell you something. I'm going to take it a step further. I'm going to shock some charismatic people right now. You're never going to develop in anything unless you're praying in tongues all the time. Because the New Testament teaches us very clearly that the Holy Spirit works certain ways. And you have to ask. You have to seek. You have to find. And this whole idea of asking and seeking and seeking God and finding. God knew that we, were gonna, we, we weren't going to be able to do this just in the natural realm. We needed the help. We needed a link between heaven and earth. Praise God. Hallelujah. We needed something that we could, so we could, that we could be empowered to vocalize and to cry out to God and to, and to seek God and to, and, and to uh, uh, be able to communicate with Him on such an intimate level that we could discuss absolutely anything with Him that needed to be discussed. Because our minds do not have the capacity to do that in the natural. And most Christians still are praying out of their minds most of the time, and this limits them. Can you all say amen? amen? Now go to John chapter 13 very quickly. A few scriptures here to get us going. I'm going to move along. Say, Pastor Tom, we've heard all this before. Well, then how come the Lord has me keep coming back to it? Apparently we haven't heard. We've heard, but we haven't done much with it. 
or something because, I, you know, I'd like to get off some of these things. Of course, I'm on television now. Maybe that's what it is. John chapter 13, verse 34 says this. A new suggestion I give unto you. Whoops. A new what? Okay, here we go again. A new commandment I give unto you that you what? Agape. Everybody say agape. Or in other words, you love one another with God's love. Not with friendship love. Not just with uh, erotic love, of course. Not just with the human natural love. Not just the love that a mother has for a daughter. Or uh, a, 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 a grandpa would have for a grandchildren. That, that, that might be a strong sort of human love, but it's not as powerful as God's love. Amen. He says a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus, as, as God has loved us. How did God love us? For God so loved the world that He gave. He died for us. That's how far you go, baby. In other words, if somebody was going to, 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 to uh, uh, line us all up over here and said, okay, Peggy's going to get it in the head with a shotgun. Unless one of you take her place, we all ought to be standing up saying, take me, take me. Because we have that kind of love for one another. Because love has no fear. I know where I'm going. I take a shotgun shell for Peggy. Make sure they shoot me good so I don't flop around but all right moving right along i'm a little brutal okay a new commandment i give unto you that you love one another as i have loved you that you also love one another give up your lives lay down your lives for one another unselfishly there's so much selfishness it's just it just disgusts me how much selfishness there is in people's lives by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. By this, by this love operating in our lives, everybody will know we're his disciples. Now, we have done a really poor job. The world thinks the church, for the most part, is a joke because we don't demonstrate that love. If we were demonstrating that love, they would not think we're a joke. You know, I don't know, what, I don't care what political things you, you're into, but one thing has been good this year is this man, Mike Huckabee. Because Mike Huckabee is a very loving, loving, likable person who actually acts like a Christian. For God, it's great to have a political figure who actually knows how to answer questions and has a sense of humor and walks in love. Can you all say amen? And he's been a real good testimony about what Christians really are. They can't figure him out, you know, and how come, how come he keeps winning sometimes. Well, people like him. How many know people are supposed to like Christians? Christians should be the happiest, the most uh, joyful. And, you know, he's not ashamed. He's not, he's not ashamed to answer about his faith. He just relaxes and tells them about it, you know, and I think that's wonderful. Can you all say amen? So, <clears throat> love is important. It is the keynote thing of the New Testament. Now, I want you to go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John, little John, chapter 4. So our development in love is important because we're going to find out here in a minute that love is tied into everything in our Christian life. Doesn't matter what it is. And you're going to find that love is linked to tongues. And you're going to find tongues is linked to love. In fact, you're going to find tongues is linked and love is linked to everything in our Christian life. Tongues is linked to everything in our Christian life because tongues is linked to love. Because... And I don't want to go too far too quick, but look at 1 John chapter 4, verse, verse uh, 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is what? Love. So God is love. Everybody say it out loud. God is love. God is love. So God is love. So if you're going to love, you're going to have to know God. And if you're going to walk in love, you're going to have to utilize the prayer language. Now understand this where does the prayer language come from it comes through the holy spirit who is in our spirit our spirit praying by the power and anointing of the holy spirit who is the holy spirit god who is god love hello so i wish the body of christ could understand this because you see my dear brother and sister god 
Everybody say, is love. Now, let me link this together with you here because it's important. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. So we can see how important it is to be filled with the Holy Ghost and to operate over there in the Spirit-filled life. As a Christian, you will never be successful in any area or endeavor of life without it. You will struggle. You'll struggle in your marriage. You'll struggle with your family. You say, well, I have a good marriage. It could be better, though. Everybody say amen. amen. It doesn't matter what level you're on. Right. You want to be, be better. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. We want to excel. Yes. Yeah, will it help me in business? Yes, it'll help you in business. Character even helps you in business. You'll find out that if you can go to work and actually be a nice human being, you will excel. Amen. You stick out like a sore thumb. Now, I don't. I mean, that's not a good illustration, but you do. You stick out because you see most people when they go to work. I, I just, I'm never amazed when I go to these restaurants and people are supposed to be serving me. You're paying money, sometimes a lot of money. How many know a hundred dollars a lot of money? So you're popping out a hundred dollar bill. And these people act like they're doing you a favor to bring you some water. How many know that's not right? So in Galatians chapter 5, are you there? Let's look at verse 13. We're going to be reading a few scriptures here. 13. Now I'm going to read out of the Amplified Bible. Everybody say Amplified. Amplified. For you, brethren, were indeed called to freedom. Only do not let your freedom be an incentive to your flesh. In other words, because you've been forgiven for your sins and cleansed from your sins and, and you're free in Jesus, that should not be an incentive to say, well, I'm forgiven. I can go do what I want. How many know that ain't going to work very well? Amen. A lot of people do that. Yes. An opportunity <coughs> or excuse for selfishness. <clears throat> but through love or agape, you should what? Serve one another. Now notice this. Listen very carefully. Verse 14, Amplified Bible. For the whole law concerning human relationships is compiled within this one precept. You shall love your neighbor as you do yourself. Look up at me. The whole, everybody say law, law. of human relationships is compiled in this one thing, learning how to agape one another. Treat each other with God's love, not the world's love, not the, 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 the eros or the, the you know, uh, erotic love or the, the friendship love, but God's love. Everything to do with any human relationship whatsoever, friendship whatsoever, uh, marriage whatsoever, doesn't matter. Anything to do with relationships is compiled within that one statement. Now, how many know Dr. Phil needs to understand that? Because that's all Dr. Phil, if he really wants to help people, all he needs to do is focus on that one thing right there. If he could get these couples and these families that he has, well, some of them are pretty squirrely. First of all, they've got to get born again. Then they need to start get filled with the Holy Ghost. Then they need to start applying this. Can you all say amen? Well, Pastor Tom, are you trying to tell me that everything... In everything concerning work, how many know work's a relationship? Yeah. Yeah. Everything concerning my job or my business is compiled within this? Absolutely. You've you got to listen because, you see, God's a very successful person. And God is love. He knows how to do it. Every, he knows how to do everything. But everything in God comes from love. And it's not the type of love that you think sometimes. God's love can be very firm sometimes. God's love can slap you around a little bit sometimes. But God's love will never do anything that is wrong. It's always right. It always has your best intentions. Even if he has to chastise you. Even if he has to call you back from where you're not, when you're not doing things right. Or he has to do something even dramatic in your life to wake you up a little bit. It's always because he what? He loves us. You guys getting anything out of this? Every facet of developing deep roots of character starts with developing God's love. 
Because love is linked to all things relating to character. And to develop this love walk, one must understand the connection or link that other tongues plays in the Christian life. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 says this, reading out of the King James Version. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no what? There is no law. Now I want you to think about this for a second. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and he goes down the list. But really what he's saying here is the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. And you'll find because God is love, that out of love, when you walk in love, or you have love, or you're connected to love, will come joy. How many know you can't have love without joy? If you want joy, you've got to walk in love. It's also connected to peace. It's also connected to faithfulness. It's connected to all the fruits of the Spirit or character being developed in our life. So it becomes the most important thing. You walk in love, you're going to have peace. You walk in love, you're going to be faithful. If you walk in love, you're going to have meekness and all of that kind of thing, gentleness. If you walk in love, all of these things are connected, and they're connected to the work of the Holy Spirit. But people, some have just said, well, Pastor Tom, now it's just the Holy Spirit on the inside of us sitting there who brings about those things. No, the Holy Spirit doesn't just bring about anything. You have to cooperate with Him. This is where we're missing it. This is where people miss it. The Holy Spirit is there. He can live in some people. They've been born again for 25 years and he's done absolutely nothing hardly for them because they're lazy and no count. How many know if you don't read your Bible, you can't ever get any information that the Holy Ghost can help you with? Huh? I said, huh? See, we always met, denominations are like this. You know, the denominational thought is, que sera, sera, what will be, will be. If God is God, He's just going to do it. You know, and they make all kinds of comments about how great God is and how mighty He is. And that's true. God is great and God is mighty, but He's not going to do diddly squat till you cooperate with Him. He's not going to do anything in, much in your life until you cooperate, unless somebody else prays for you. We'll talk about that later. Because if it wasn't for charismatic people, spirit-filled people praying, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ would be sadly, as bad as it is now, it would be ten times worse. Now, everybody say, the Holy Ghost. Ghost. Now, I'm going to go to a scripture. Now, let's tie this in. I want you to go to Romans chapter 5. And we'll begin to to, to show you how this all links together here. Romans chapter 5. I want you to think, think this thing through with me now. The Bible says that when we're born again, the love of God or God's spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Bible talks about when we're filled with the spirit, the Holy Spirit will come upon us and fill us to overflowing. Can you all say amen? But look at Romans chapter 5, and I want you, please, to look at verse 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God, everybody say the love of God, God. is what? Shed abroad in our hearts or spirits by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Now, the the Amplified says, such hope never disappoints or, or, or deludes or shames us. For God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Ghost who is given unto us. God's love is shed abroad. Say this with me out loud. God's love love is shed abroad abroad in our spirits. spirits. How? By the who? Now, when I first got saved, I I can't, you know, I came amongst faith people. um, People taught, well, that happens one time at the new birth. But that's not what it says. It doesn't say this just happens one time. I'm going to tell you right now that God's spirit in our spirit Praise God is always shedding forth love that we will need to be able to walk with character and develop. Can you all say amen? God is always giving us what we need. If you face a real difficult situation, hallelujah, as an example, and you've got somebody that you're dealing with that is rough to have to love. How many here have ever seen somebody like that? 
Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe a spouse is going through a rough time and it's being ugly. Or maybe it's just, praise God, somebody at work. Maybe it's just, you know, the boss from hell or something like that. Let me tell you something. God is faithful if we will pray to give us, praise God, the amount of love that we will need, no matter what the situation may be, to help us to stay over there, to keep our heart right, and to stay in the love of God. Come on, everybody. If, if we will do our part. Now, I'm going to connect it to you because everybody says, well, the Holy Spirit just does that. No, the Holy Spirit does it when we do certain things. All right, now let's go and, and look at these things. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Guys, get anything out of this yeah. now? Now we're going to get into the heavy part here so you can see it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. How many got a ribbon in your Bible? Do you got one of those little ribbons? And then I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And I want you to hold places in both of them. And when you get over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you just put your little ribbon in there. Because we're going to be flipping back from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 so that you can begin to see the divine connection. <coughs> the missing link. We spent the last few weeks establishing the fact <coughs> that God wants all of His people to be filled with the Holy Ghost and receive their prayer languages. He commanded them to do it. Jesus said, don't you do anything until you get filled with the Holy Ghost. That's right. The church world during the Dark Ages totally almost lost the concept of that. We're starting to get it back. Across the world now, over 50% of all the Christians worldwide are spirit-filled Christians and speak in tongues. In America, it's much lower because Americans tend to think they can do everything on their own. America has so much pride that we don't, you know, over there, man, I tell you what, you live in some of these places overseas, they don't have welfare and all this other stuff. I tell you what, if you don't, if you don't somehow come up with the concept of getting food on your table, you're going to die. You all understand? And so that will cause people to pray. Can you all say amen and to seek God? Seriously. And so we, there's, there's much more need over there. And because there's much more need, then people will seek God with all their hearts. And so they don't sit there and argue about things theologically. When they see something that's a benefit, they grab it with everything they got. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it's kind of the way I am anyway, because I know with my flesh there's nothing good. You haven't learned that? By now you will. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Bible. Verse 1. As for myself, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony and evidence or mystery and secret. Everybody say mystery and secret. Mystery and secret. Of God concerning what he has done through Christ for the salvation of men in lofty words of eloquence or human philosophy and wisdom. For I resolved to know nothing, to be acquainted with nothing, to make a display of the knowledge of nothing, and to be conscious of nothing among you except Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and Him crucified. Amen. And I was in past and in state of weakness and fear and dread and great trembling after I had come among you. And my language, everybody say, my language. My language. And my what? My message were not set forth in persuasive, enticing, and plausible words of wisdom, but they were in a demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power, a proof of the spirit and power of God operating on me and stirring in the minds of my hearers the most holy emotions and persuading them. So that your faith must, uh, faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, human philosophy, but in the power of God. Hallelujah. Now, folks, what's he saying? Paul wasn't your average preacher. Paul wasn't like they are today. Paul understood, praise God, the importance of the power of the Holy Ghost. In fact, Paul knew some things, okay? And he says, here, I got this. These are mysteries that are gleaned, praise God. He didn't get them by eating chicken. He got them by praying in tongues. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and look at verse 18 very quickly. Paul said this, I thank God that I speak in strange tongues, languages, 
more than any or all of you put together. Amplified version. Paul said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than y'all. King James Version, Southern Jerusalem. Can y'all say amen? And you need to understand there's a, there is a link here. Paul wrote half of the New Testament, maybe three-fourths of the New Testament, if you, if you believe he wrote Hebrews. And how many know that was revelation? He got it from somewhere. The key to his understanding of this is the more that he prayed in the Spirit, the more his Spirit, with the Holy Spirit who was indwelling his Spirit, talked over, praise God, these mysteries. The power of the Holy Spirit empowering his prayer life to ask questions and to glean into his spirit the ability to, to get things out of the Word and revelation will come and, 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 and whatever it may be that he's doing. So Paul knew about how to get the mysteries off of the page and into his heart. Can you all say amen? amen. And then he went on and said, now it's not going to do me any good to do what I do in private over here in the church house. <coughs> he said, I'm going to go here, <coughs> over here and start speaking in tongues. He said, it'll build me up. Now, I just, I'm just not going to sit there and speak in tongues all day to you. He says, I'm going to take what I have learned and I'm going to impart it unto you so you can understand it. Paul got it by revelation. Paul got it because he prayed in the Spirit. Paul was a, a, a man of God because he prayed in the Spirit. Paul's future was always being prayed out. Paul had already prayed out his future when he got to something. This is why you see him get delivered from all of this stuff. Even though it looks like he's going to die about half the time, he gets thrown in the, in, the, in, in the drink, he gets put in prison, all of these things. Paul had already prayed that thing through. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Until he came to the end of his life when Paul finally said, it's time for me to go. Hallelujah. Amen. And you need to understand, and I need to understand, that Paul had an understanding of this that the body of Christ has missed. Paul understood what we're going to show you right now. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, notice this. Are you there? Yes. For one who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not to men but to God. That's praying. Amen. For no one understands or catches his meaning because in the Holy Spirit he utters what? Secret truths and hidden things not obvious to the understanding. Back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Drop down to the very first verse. As for myself, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come proclaiming to you testimony and evidence or mystery and secrets of God concerning what he has done through Christ for salvation of men, lost the elegance of words or human philosophy and wisdom. He, there are mysteries and things that he gleaned from the word of God that were powerful. Can you all say amen? These mysteries, many of them were given to him in his prayer life <coughs> as he prayed in the spirit. Can you all say amen? Now let's continue to read here because I don't want to get ahead of myself. And let's read some more out of here uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse, um, verse 6. Yet when we, were, 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 when we are among the full-grown spiritual mature Christians who are ripe in understanding, we do impart a higher wisdom, the knowledge of the divine plan previously hidden. But it is indeed not a wisdom of this present age or of this world, nor of the ledgers, rulers of this age, are being brought to nothing and are doomed to pass away. But rather that we are setting forth a wisdom of God once hidden from human understanding. Everybody say once hidden. It's not hidden anymore. And now revealed to us by who? By God. That wisdom which God devised and decreed before the ages for our glorification. To lift us into the glory of his presence. None of the rulers of this age... Uh, or world perceived and recognized and understood this, for if they had, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. But on the contrary, as the scripture says, what eye has not seen and ear has not heard has not entered into the heart of man. All that God had prepared and, uh, and made and keeps him ready for those who love God, who hold him in affectionate reverence, promptly obeying and gratefully recognizing the benefits he has bestowed. Now let me read that to you out of the King James. I like that a little bit better. But as it is written, eye has not seen nor ear heard, Neither has entered into the heart. Everybody say the heart. the heart. The heart of man, the things which God has prepared for them that love them. Everybody look up at me. I've heard preachers preach that in the New Testament, saying you can't understand much about God. God moves in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. Mm -hmm. And all this kind of mess. 
and they, 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 they're, what they're saying is God is so big and so vast, there's no possible way that we can understand anything about him, so you might as well not try. How many know that Paul is, is, Paul is in this particular verse of Scripture quoting something from the Old Covenant? In the Old Covenant, they had limited understanding. They didn't understand about the devil. They didn't understand about authority. They didn't have the same covenant we had. Can you all say amen? They understood some things about God, but very little, really. They were left just to kind of do the best they could. And God took care of them as best he could with the covenant that they had together. And he says there, he says in verse 9, he says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart the things which God has prepared for them that love them. Verse 10, but. Everybody say but. but. There's a but. Yes. There's a big but. <laughs> Everybody say amen. amen. But God has, out of the King James, but God has already revealed them unto who? Us. By His how? Spirit. For the Spirit searches what all things not some things all things yea even the deep things of god hallelujah so paul says in the new covenant he says the spirit of god praise god has revealed them to us he's already there the spirit of wisdom and revelation the spirit of love the spirit of mercy the spirit of faith everything we need is on the inside of us he's in there waiting to give us all deep even the deepest things of god Amen? Amen. Now that's good. We say, oh yeah, the Holy Ghost has all those things. We could just somehow get connected. But look at verse 12. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might what? Know or understand or perceive or recognize the things are, that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak not in words which men's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost. Everybody say the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Amen. The Holy Ghost teaches. Words. The Holy Ghost uses words to teach. As you pray in the Spirit, you're, you're going to find out the Bible says you are edifying yourself. You're building yourself up. You're making yourself better. The Holy Spirit in your spirit is initiating a conversation that will draw the wisdom of God that you need in your life from the Bible or from other places, even in a service like this, and get it into your life. The Holy Spirit's job is to work to get everything you need in your life to give you the wisdom and the understanding, praise God, that you need to be successful in life. So, the, so God has placed the Holy Spirit. Now, let's keep reading because it's going to get better. Verse 14, But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Now, that, that, that could be both Christians and non-Christians. But he that is spiritual judge all things, yet he's judged no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Say, we have the mind of Christ. Yeah. No, that's New Covenant. Stop saying that stuff. God moves in mysterious ways. Right. Folks, we are to know the mysteries of God, even the deep things of God. The Bible says we're supposed to know them. Yeah. Now, here's what it is. See, folks, we are connected. His Spirit comes and lives within our spirit. We are vitally connected with God. And when we pray in the Spirit, praise God, hallelujah, we begin to talk over, yea, even the deep things of God. We begin to talk over. How many know man is deep? <clears throat> the Bible says man is deep. The Bible says God is deep and man is deep. Because God created man in his image and likeness. There is no other animals out here that are spirit beings created in the image and likeness of God. Right. We are deep because we are able and we have the capacity to we're eternal. We have the capacity of understanding things beyond our wildest dreams. 
We have the understanding of expanding spiritually more than we ever thought possible. We have the, we have the ability to go and to, and to operate over here as Jesus operated. We have a full capacity for all of that in our spirits. And he says, I put my Holy Spirit, and he says, I put your spirit uh, together. And he says, they have that divine fellowship. And praise God, as we pray in the spirit now, we begin to draw, hallelujah, what we need from God into our lives. Now, let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 with that in mind. You guys get anything at all? Yeah. This is the missing link. Now, I'm talking about love today, but I'm going to be talking about anything. God can talk over... I like this. God can give you the ability to talk over anything with God. Amen. And how many know God knows you better than you know yourself? You may say, Lord, I need a new car. Or, I need something. I, I need this to happen in my life. The Lord says, no, that's not exactly what you need. That's what you think you need. But what you really need is this to happen. So that because you're, 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 th- you're looking at it from, a, from a, our perspective, right? Which is very limited sometimes. God says, no, when this happens, this will all happen. So God, as you pray in tongues, see, this is why tongues is so important. He can talk that all over. We'll talk about that in a minute. And get to the root of the problem. While we're sitting there thinking we are believing God for something or something, sometimes God has to remove obstacles and stuff in our lives to get us to a place to where we can receive that kind of thing. If you're not praying in tongues, you're not going anywhere. You're going to spin your wheels like most Christians do, and you're going to make up weird doctrines about God that aren't true. You're going to be confused. You're going to be out there in left field thinking that God's doing everything to you and everything that comes down the pike is from him, so you just have to accept it. That is a foolish, foolish, foolish person who believes that kind of stuff. And if you believe that and you think that way, you're basically going to live in a world over here of hurt. And most of the church has lived in a world of hurt, and so we made up doctrines. It's good to hurt. It's good for you to be sick and afflicted and everything because somehow God's working out his divine plan and all that. Baha, bah humbug, stupidity. God's desire is to get to the root of the problem and get rid of all that junk so that you can go on and have a testimony about how God delivered you. Can you all say amen? You take tongues out of the, uh, you take the, the prayer language out of that. Now, folks, I'm not just talking about somebody who flaps their gums five minutes a day. God expects us to pray all the time this way, constantly. We'll get to that. I'm working. I'm doing good. I'm, I'm trying. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14. <clears throat> Amplify Bible. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit, by the Holy Spirit within me, prays. But my mind is unproductive. It bears no fruit. It helps nobody. My mind's out of the way. I'm talking these things over with God because God is a spirit. My, my spirit now, by the help of the Holy Spirit, has the capacity to talk things over with God. How many know that's just powerful right there? That ought to tell us something right there. If, the, if that was the only scripture in the Bible we had about praying in tongues, I would say go for it. Let me read it to you again, verse 14. If, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit, by the Holy Spirit within me, prays, but my mind is unproductive. My spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit within me, prays. My spirit, by the power of God Almighty, prays. My spirit, by the power of love, prays. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If this don't turn you on, you need to be raised from the dead. My spirit has the capacity because my spirit now is a born again man, a spirit filled man is indwelt by Almighty God Himself, has the capacity, praise God, to be empowered to pray whatever He wants to pray about. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. Amplified version. For one who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not to men, but to God. Now, a message in tongues, like this morning, was God. That's a different gift. Still tongues, it's just a diverse, different kind of tongues. 
is a message. It needs to be interpreted. But most of the time, tongues is to be used in a private devotions. Your prayer life. For one who speaks in an unknown tongue does not speak to men but to God. How many know that's good? How many here know it's good to speak to God? For no one understands him or catches his meaning <coughs> because in the Holy Spirit he utters secret truths and hidden things not obvious to your pea brain. My translation. <laughs> that, that's Tom Terry's version. I want you to think about this. Hidden truth. Mysteries? What kind of mysteries? What kind of hidden things? What kind of secrets? Secrets out of the Word? Secrets from the Bible that are there all the time? Revelation knowledge? Wisdom? But let's not stop there. How many know God's smarter than that? Huh? How about secret mysteries about how to raise your children? How about secret mysteries and hidden things about who you should marry? How many know God can be praying for them for years as you pray in tongues, molding their character and bringing about the aspects in their life that are necessary? And as both of you are praying in the Spirit, two Spirit-filled Christians begin to pray in the Spirit, God begins to pray out their futures together and finally their, fu- their futures connect as, as God brings them together and they become one, a powerful force for God. And things just go up another level. Because now you've got two people. And God's uttering divine secrets and mystery. How about school? Well, God will help me in physics. How many know God invented the whole thing? He knows more about that than Einstein or anybody else. Einstein was a pea head compared to God. God has the cure for cancer. God has the cure for AIDS. God's got the cure for everything, even in the natural realm. He can even, tell, he can even talk to somebody about going and picking some kind of plant and doing something to it that will kill leukemia. Because, but because spirit-filled Christians... Now listen to me. Spirit-filled Christians have not done their job. The world suffers and continues to suffer. While God wants to reveal these things, but He's not going to do it, He does it His way. Not, it's not Burger King. You cannot serve God your own way. You can't just do your own thing. You can't have it your way. I don't like that tongue stuff. Well, why in the world not? Well, it scares me. What are you scared of? You ought to be scared of the, uh, of the things of hell. I'm going to be scared of anything out here. I'm going out here and, you know, and having to live in this crazy world. Yes. What are you afraid of? What, what, what's keeping you back? What, what, is, what, what is keeping you? It's got to be the devil. The devil's not. He's the one who wants to keep you away from the things of God. The devil makes up every kind of excuse in the world. I'm not ready yet. You ever hear that? I'm not ready yet. Well, Jesus said you are. Today is the day of salvation. Salvation means much more than just getting saved and going to heaven. Salvation can mean getting filled with the Holy Ghost. That's part of our salvation. Today is the day. Yeah, but Pastor Tom, you know, I, you know, not everybody, not everybody. It, it comes as a gift. Not everybody has that gift. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. All Christians are to be spirit-filled. Not everybody has a gift where they're going to uh, give a message in tongues and interpret it in a service. The Holy Spirit doesn't come on people and anoint everybody to do that. Come on, everybody. Did you all hear what I just said? You know, it's really neat when you hear somebody on the radio describe all this kind of stuff about the gifts of the Spirit and about the Spirit-filled life who isn't Spirit-filled. How many know they're going to be confused? How can you talk about something when you don't know anything about it? If I was them, I think I'd be quiet. How many here can see the link? Your spirit. Linking with love. When you pray, it begins to be shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Ghost. And we're talking about love this morning. All right. 
Proverbs chapter 20. Don't go over there. Proverbs chapter 20 verses, uh, uh, excuse me, chapter 4 verses 20 through 22 says that we are to keep our hearts with all diligence. One of the ways we keep our hearts is by praying in the Spirit. Can you all say amen? Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, one more time. Look at verse 14 real quick. For I pray, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit, by the Holy Spirit within me prays, but my mind is unproductive. King James says, for, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. <coughs> now, let's go over here to Jude chapter 20. Uh, Jude. I keep saying chapter, but there's only verse 20. Just go to Revelation and hang a left. Jude's right in front of Revelation. Let's bring this down to where we live. Pastor Tom, I have a hard time forgiving. I've been, I've been offended for 27 years because my, 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 my wife left me or my husband left me or somebody abused me. And I just can't seem to get delivered from it. And I've been to a psychiatrist for 33 years. <laughs> I'm serious. We've got this thing going on in the church. It's just like endless excuses about things that are not necessary. Because how many know God is bigger than any hurt or wound or pain or abuse or situation, no matter how devastating it is, even to your emotions? Now, folks, a lot of people think that praying in tongues is just a spiritual exercise, but it improves every aspect of our life. The Bible says that. In fact, they've proven that speaking in other tongues at Oral Roberts University, uh, a lady there who is an evangelist, husband is a psychiatrist, and they did, they did tests, <coughs> and they proved that when you pray in tongues, you do it long enough, it improves your immune system. It's better than echinacea. <laughs> or olive leaf extract, which are pretty good. Did I say that right? Jude, look at verse 20. Look at verse 20. Pastor Tom, does praying in tongues have anything to do with helping your mind? How many know God's talking over all of the things you need to get your mind squared away? And God will bring you teachings. He'll bring you people. He'll bring you books. He'll bring you tapes. You have to cooperate with Him. He'll bring you everything you need to get your mind healed and renewed. And he'll even rise up on the inside of you. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit quickens our mortal bodies. That would include our brains. Quickens our mortal bodies by the Spirit of God on the inside of us. Makes alive our mortal bodies. I'm positive if they could, and they could record it somehow, when you're praying in tongues, all kinds of things are happening in your physical body, in your mind. It is, it's, it's being charged, it's being renewed, it's being refreshed. Things are happening because God's life is being imparted to us. In Jude 20, verse 20, it says, But you, beloved, build yourselves up, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Everybody say, holy faith. Holy faith. Praying in the what? The, the Holy Ghost. Ghost. Praying in tongues. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now here's the key. He says when you pray in tongues, you, because we just read praying in tongues is praying in the, Spirit, in the Holy Spirit right over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Y'all saw that, right? That's what he's talking about here. He says when you pray in tongues, he says when you, you are building yourself up on your most holy. Number one, Praying in tongues will bring about holiness. Your most holy, what? Faith. You build up your faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But praying in tongues will keep you built up in faith. Keep that word operating and functioning the way it's supposed to. Can you all say amen on the inside of you? And sometimes even special faith will kick in. I know that. You pray in tongues long enough, your life will have a manifestation of special faith beyond your faith, supernatural faith that receives answers from God over things that are beyond anything that we have in our, in our natural faith. But he also says, you shall, and, and let me read it to you out of, the, uh, uh, out of the Amplified. But you, beloved, build yourselves founded on your most holy faith. Make progress. How many want to make progress? Yes. Rise like an edifice, higher and higher, praying in the Holy Spirit. 
guard and keep yourselves in the love of God, except and, and patiently wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. As you pray in tongues, you keep yourselves in the love of God. Now, let's say we're over here and we have a situation over here in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. I'm going to read it to you. It just says, love your enemies. Do good to those who despitefully use you and wrong you. Jesus told them that. Love your enemies. He said, copy them. Now, I'm sure when the disciples heard that and they're in the natural realm, they hadn't been filled with the Holy Ghost, they're saying, "Uh uh-huh, sure, that's going to work real good. I know myself. I can go along and fake that for a while. But I really, really, deep down on the inside of me, I can't, I, you know, I'm going to be sitting there and all of a sudden in the inside of me is going to rise up. I might not be killing them on the outside, but I'll be doing it on the inside. How many know what I'm talking about? You ever have one of those visions where you got somebody's neck and squeeze? Yeah? Okay. He said, <laughs> we're sunk. They're thinking we're, they're, we're sunk. We can't do this stuff Jesus told us to do. But Jesus was setting them up. And then Peter went and he denied the Lord three times. And they all, had, they all denied the Lord. And they were scattered because of a girl. Some girl standing there with, you know, saying, aren't you one of the disciples? And he folded like an old deck of cards. And they're all embarrassed. And they're all, they're all humbled. And they all feel like a bunch of losers. And Jesus appears to them, blows on them, said, receive the Holy Ghost. Now you go wait over here until you're empowered from on high. Don't go do anything, guys. By then, I'm sure they're saying whatever you say. I'm just glad I got a second chance. So they go sit there. And when the power of the Holy Ghost came on them, Peter was so filled with the Holy Ghost. This man was so completely changed and empowered by the Holy Ghost that he got up in front of 3,000 people knowing that the Lord had told him, you're going you're gonna to die the same way I did, only it's going to be different. They, they crucified him upside down. And he knew that was his lot. Jesus had talked to him about that. Knowing it could happen any minute, Jesus didn't put a time limit on it. And he got up. He could have cared less if he died or not. And he preached. Those 3,000 people got born again, filled with the Holy Ghost and everything. And folks, let me tell you something. I want you to listen to me very carefully. This is why we need the power of the Holy Ghost. The love of God in Peter was so strong that it overcame all of his self-centeredness and selfishness. Enough to not care what happened to him, but to care about 3,000 people that were on their way to hell. This is what praying in the Spirit will do. You might have a hard time with somebody, but if you go to God and you say, Father, I got something I need to talk to you about. That person has really wronged me and I have a hard time with what's going on right now. And I can pray all these prayers out here and I can by faith, you know, believe I receive forgiveness and stuff and that's good. But what I want you to do is I want the Holy Spirit, because I don't know how to pray as I ought about this. I want the Holy Spirit to help me pray this thing through and just begin to pray in the Spirit and find out what happens. God will begin to birth within you such character and such love that even the worst sinners or the ones who hurt you the worst, it will not hinder you. It will not cause you to be bitter. It won't cause you to stumble. It won't cause you to backslide. It won't cause you to get you know, hurt. It won't cause you to leave church. Come on, everybody. You will, you will begin to develop within you such character that it doesn't really matter what people do to you. You're just there to love on people, no matter what they do. Isn't that good? How's it happen? By praying in tongues. How much? A lot all the time. As much as you possibly can. Paul said, I pray in tongues more than y'all. I picked up on that early in my life. Started doing it, not even knowing what I was doing, just being led by the Holy Ghost. And I can tell you right now, That God can pray, even as a baby Christian, you can pray any kind of prayer in the Bible in tongues, not even know what you're doing half the time. Isn't that wonderful? You can cover the entire span of your prayer life by praying in the Spirit a lot. I got things happen to me, I just kind of floated through life. I didn't know a lot of of things, but God just blessed me anyway. Why? Because I was talking to Him, I was talking to my Father a lot. 
That's all I did. I just talked to him all the time, and he, and he was saying, okay, you need this. So I didn't know what I needed, but he did, so he gave me the utterance in that. I'm sure we talked it over. And you know, the Bible says, ask and you shall receive. But God is so good, he helps you to ask for the right thing. Isn't that neat? Think about that for a second. Instead of you sitting there with a prayer list, oh, bless George. Uh, uh, you can say, Lord, I lift these people up to you by faith. And you can start praying in the Spirit, and God can cover everything in their lives, every finite detail in their life, and pray per- through you the perfect will of God, and begin to work in their lives in every way that is necessary to do whatever it is that they need to be done in their life. All God's looking for is somebody to stand in the gap and do it. Take the time and not be selfish. Spend the time to stand your feet.